I'm Chris McDonough, a retired homicide detective. I've interviewed thousands of people, from serial killers to ministers. Welcome to the interview room. Welcome to the interview room, everybody. Coming to you from an undisclosed location. And if you'll notice, I've got one of the brightest legal minds in the country with us tonight, Mr. Billy Little Jr. (laughs) We're so grateful that you're here. Have we got a show for you? If you're new to TIR, we hope you will take the time to hit that subscribe button. We hope the time. Uh, we hope that you will um, follow us here. That's all we ask. Let me tell you a little bit about our guest tonight. For those of you who are new with us, Billy Little Jr. is probably one of the most brightest legal minds in this country. He has handled well over 17 death penalty cases. He's been a judge, he's been a defense attorney, he's been a prosecutor, and he's also been an investigator on both sides of the coin. He's also a proud military veteran serving in the United States Marine Corps as a Marine Corps officer, as well as in the United States Air Force, ultimately retiring as a colonel in the Air Force. And then he worked in the public sector Uh, And he still does a lot of work for the Indian tribes throughout uh, the Arizona area. And he is an internationally known uh, attorney who I invited here tonight because not only is he a dear friend, uh, but I have been on the other side of sitting on the stand uh, where Billy has uh, been asking the question. And as they say, you know, (laughs) fortunately, I was not the one getting fonged. Uh, but I have seen him absolutely eviscerate, um, people in the courtroom. So that said, my brother, Billy, welcome this evening to the interview room. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. I think about half of that was true, but I appreciate the kind words. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. You know, don't give them anything to, (laughs) to, to, We're so grateful to each and every one of you here tonight, uh, to our members, our subscribers, our Patreon members. We can't do this without you. And boy, we've got a lot to cover, don't we, Bill? Yeah, we do. I want, and I really want to cover some stuff that is not being covered in the rest of the media. Some get some behind the scenes stuff. Um, talk about some of the evidence and some of what is going on uh, and the things to look for going forward. So I, we're only going to cover stuff, I think, that has not been covered anywhere else. So that should be good. Should be more interesting to people. Absolutely. And so some of the ground rules, everybody, uh, if you have questions or anything like that that come up, uh, it's not that we don't catch them right away. We kind of get into a rhythm uh, and I'll try to flag them. I want to thank our new members you know, coming in. We appreciate each and every one of you. Um, but. Um, Billy's the real deal. He is uh, doing, you know, stuff right now as we speak in the courtrooms across this country. So um, that said, Billy, where do you want to take us tonight? Well, first of all, you you and I both read the affidavit. What was your first takeaway? Uh, prosecutor has a very strong case because what we're seeing there, all they need to disclose is enough to get them across the 50% threshold. They don't have, need to get beyond reasonable doubt right now. But what they've laid out there is a very strong case, and it shows some excellent, excellent police work. Um, they did a nice job. 
really proud of those guys. Yeah. And so some of the highlights, we're just going to kind of, I'm just going to drop a couple of bullet points in terms of what um, Billy and I caught here as bombshells, right? Police were on the police were onto this guy, November 29th. Uh, his phone pinged at least 12 times outside of the 1122 King road residence before November 13th, which is the date of the homicide. All but one of the 12 times was late in the evening to the early morning hours. So as Dr. Bricado had laid out and others, uh, we nailed this guy in terms of surveilling that house and that he would been have been familiar to that residence. Yeah, it's and, interesting and a mistake that he made that um, <laughs> he turned his phone off during the relevant time period. Yeah, and then turned and, it back on after the murders. I mean, what a, what a dumb mistake. And and you know, the, people are forgetting, right, Billy, that this guy's he also has a degree in forensic technology. So his, you know, that was his minor forensic technology, and he he signed up for a, uh, you know, uh, an internship at the local PD there to help them, you know, with that uh, problem. Right. I mean, yeah. And, and to your point, he shuts it off during the murder. That's crazy. He, he views himself as very smart and he's clearly not. Yep. And, and by the way, we all uh, know, and we're going to preface this tonight. Everybody is innocent, to, you know, till proven guilty uh, in a court of law. And that means Mr. KB is as well. So that, that is out of the way. So another bullet point here, we return to the crime scene about five hours later, we nailed that point. Uh, we said he would come back, and sure enough, it sounds like he did. And what's really interesting, I'm hearing that he came back on the 14th, uh, which was the day of that uh, newsreel, where I um, looked in the background and asked you guys, do you think this is a, a, a car uh, that looks similar to the one they're looking for in the background? Well, it just happens to be the same day that his phone pinged uh, over there is my understanding. A latent shoe print was found outside one of the survivor roommate's bedroom. Uh, and then this is the one who saw the killer inside of the residence. So this may explain some of the psychology going on with this poor young girl who was an eyewitness to this guy in that apartment, why she was frozen in time at that time. I mean, for all we know, he went out she sees him leave because he walks right past her, goes outside. For all we know, she panics, goes inside, locks the door, and he comes back in to finish the deal because they found a footprint right there on the outside of her door. So uh, pure terror there. Thoughts yeah. on that, Bill? Yeah, she she did a smart thing. She saved her own life by doing that. Um yeah, and just frozen in fear. I can't imagine how frightened she must have been. Um, and anybody that thinks they know what they would do in that situation, until you've been there, you don't have any idea. So there's, she did great things. She provided a great description, which is helping the case. Um, she, thank God, she's still alive. Yeah. Uh, because that's a good piece of the case. Her little description about the tall, thin, white guy with the bushy eyebrows dressed in black and wearing a mask. So she did a great job. Yeah, and we don't and we don't know the configuration of the mask. It was obvious enough for her to see some type of uh, facial features. His bushy uh, eyebrows. Yep, and also uh, we don't know, you know, much more about what her uh, thought process was. So let's be, you know, let's be kind to these two girls that survived this whole thing. Uh, and that's also respectful to the victims because she could have not done, she couldn't have done anything, even no. if she had gone up there and confront this guy. She actually, she, she wouldn't be here. She'd be you dead know? also. They were already dead. There was nothing she could do to save them. Um, yeah. And let's, when you're ready, let's talk about the weapon. Yeah. And so, yeah, the K-bar. So you being a former, well, all once a Marine, always a Marine, you being a devil dog, uh, a milit uh, a Marine officer who has uh, served this country diligently, not only in combat, but uh, in, in many other ways. What, what do you got for us, Bill? So um, they described the K-bar and the K-bar sheath. So if anybody doesn't know what that is, 
This is the murder weapon. This is the K-Bar. It's got the the Marine Corps insignia on it. It's a standard fighting knife. This is the sheath that they're describing. And you'll notice that there's a loop here because it's intended to be worn on your belt. He obviously did not wear it on his belt because they found the sheath in the bed. Importantly, they did find his DNA. And it's important they found a single source DNA. So oftentimes you have mixed DNA, you have multiple people, but they have a single source, which is the strongest type of DNA that you can get. So when they get a match, that's a match. It's like one in 12 quadrillion uh, odds that it's somebody else. When you start getting mixed DNA, sometimes you can get down as low as one in 600, which would have been uh, not so helpful. But they got from the from the snap on it, they got a single source. And by the way, it's his, which is unhelpful to his defense, isn't it? So he had to unsnap it, right? And I don't know if this, the DNA came from the inside or the outside of the button. He had to take it out. And I can tell you that this thing, so this was lost in the bed when there was a struggle because he needed, there was a struggle. He needed to put the sheet down, use the other hand to control. This knife is unbelievably hard. It was created for the military to be used in combat. Um, the blade is super hard. You can dig with it. You can stab trees with it. Unbelievably hard. And the blade is incredibly sharp. Uh, I mean, you could probably shave with it. I can tell you that I cut my finger with it one time. Uh, I didn't even know I've cut my finger. It just cut through like a razor. I still have the scar on my hand. Just cut through like a razor. The only way I knew it was I started dripping blood from my hand. That's how sharp this thing is. Uh, it's got a nice blade guard on it. And that will prevent, because when this thing gets slippery from the blood, you don't want your hand sliding up the blade. So it's got a nice blade guard on it, nice leather wrapped handle. This was made for killing. This was made for the military. This was made for killing. Um, he went out and he got this. It's You don't find them in every store. You have to go looking for this knife. He went looking for this knife for this purpose. And I'm hoping that they can find some uh, purchase records. Um, they're going to match, and this is a little gruesome, but they're going to match uh, a K-bar. It's a seven inch uh, hardened steel blade. They're going to match that to the wounds on these victims. Uh, they can use a medical examiner. And I know you've dealt a lot with that, Chris. So have I, but my guess is they're going to go because it's such a high profile case and they're going to challenge the matching of that. Uh, so they're probably going to go with a forensic anthropologist to match the knife to the wounds and just gruesome, gruesome. And there was no way if somebody attacks you with that, uh, that knife, you're in big trouble. Big trouble. I don't know how you'd stop it. Yeah. And these two survivors just thinking through that, right? They had no idea what was going on upstairs, but can you imagine that had he, you know, done even more? Uh, because he'd already had that, you know, desire to kill, and he was successful up to that point. Billy, Billy, how talk talk about a little bit in relationship to when in the Marine Corps they issue that knife. Is that would that be accurate? No, they don't issue the knife. They issue a oh. different knife. They issue a knife that you can fit on the end of your weapon as a bayonet. Um, okay. That's a different knife. This okay. is a knife that uh, Marines purchase for themselves. It's tradition. Uh, you can tell that it's it's got the Marine Corps emblem stamped on it. The K-Bar was actually created for use by all of the military services. Uh, everybody has, every, every military service has used them, uh, but they find that the leather, like for the Navy, the leather and the salt water doesn't really work too well, um, even though Marines are amphibious as well. But so it's really a, hand-to-hand -hand fighting weapon, and a lot of Marines have them. 
Um, it's traditional for the Marines to have them. Um, I'm sure your father uh, used one when he was over in Korea in the Frozen Chosen. So uh, great, great weapon. The military used to buy them, used to issue them. Now it's uh, people will purchase them uh, and take them. I took the one I brought back from the Gulf War. My brother, who was also a Marine, um, just out of a feeling of respect and honor, I gave him the one that I had in the Gulf War. So, so uh, it, it's definitely something that a military guy uh, or a wannabe military guy, obviously, in this scenario, uh, would uh, have um, access once they get it, they can, uh, so you can basically go into an army Navy surplus store or something to that effect and, uh, purchase them. Is that, would that be an accurate yeah, well, statement? You can purchase them. I'm not sure exactly where you would purchase them. I, I obviously I'm purchased one in many, many years, but, um, they're not commonplace because there's no real practical, you can't carry it around. It doesn't fold up like a pocket knife. Uh, that knife was created for combat. Um, and if you get stabbed a single time with that razor sharp, seven inch hardened steel blade, you're dead. So let's uh, show that one more time. And then we're, let's get into some of the um, legal stuff here. Um, that's, that's it's vicious. Steel. I'm telling you that that is an indestructible knife. Um, and you get stabbed a single time with that, you're going to die. It's, it may take you a while to bleed out, right? But the wound of that is probably worse than a gunshot. You're wow. going to damage a lot of internal organs with a single stab wound with that knife. I mean, just a brutal, brutal way to kill somebody. Um, yeah. I feel bad for those families. Yeah, it's horrible. It's definitely horrible. Um, <clears throat> all right. So you have handled 17 capital murder cases, uh, at least 17 that, uh, you know, yeah, more than that. <laughs> yes. You have. And I know you've handled thousands of cases, Yes, uh, but, but you've been before, I mean, the highest courts and you've defended people uh, as well as prosecuted uh, individuals. Um, so let's talk strategy here. And I'm going to put up a um, little PowerPoint that you, um, have graciously put together a little bit earlier. Uh, and what I want to hear from you and for, for our audience and, and guys and gals, if you come up with your questions and stuff, please be patient with me as always. Uh, you know, when Billy gets focused, I don't like to throw him off uh, <laughs> because, you know, I know, I know he's laser focused and, and you're going to learn a tremendous amount of information tonight about probably what's taking place uh, as he landed and as early as today in the court hearing. Uh, yeah. And so Billy's going to break it down for us. So where do you want to go tonight, Bill? Yeah. So um, let's just go through the slideshow. I've got some bullet points on there, but I'm going to give people uh, some idea of what's going on behind the scenes and why things are happening and what to look for uh, to determine the strength or weakness of the case going forward. Um, so I will being a capital qualified attorney is a very specific specialty. It's a specialized thing. And it requires training, special training, certification by the Supreme Court, et cetera. Um, so let's get into that and why that's important and why that influences what's been going on and people have seen um, in the news. So yeah, let's start out with this because I always hear this. I mean, this is you know, presumption of innocence. And I would venture to guess that probably 90% of the people believe this is in the constitution, right? That the constitution says somewhere that you, everybody's presumed innocent. Well, that's not the case. Um, it's actually a Supreme court decision that found it under um, a due process right to a fair trial. Next slide. That, uh, and, and it makes sense, right? It, Probably, although it's not in the Constitution, probably should be because it is fundamental to the way we view things. Uh, and it's the way we want things to be viewed. We don't want because there are places like in Mexico, there's no presumption of innocence. In fact, it's quite the opposite. But that doesn't seem fair, right, that you have to go and prove your innocence. It should be that the government has to prove uh, beyond a reasonable doubt that you are guilty, especially in a case like this where they're going to seek 
the death penalty. They're going to look to execute this guy, rightfully so, in my opinion. Um, but although that's a requirement to be seated as a juror in a courtroom, there's no right. There's We don't have to presume guilt or innocence. We are free to do whatever it is we want. Um, we can look at the evidence. We can make our minds up. And if we're not jurors uh, or the judge, uh, we can make our decisions on what the facts that we see. So, and to be honest with you, when you get into a courtroom, you're talking to jurors, doing jury selection. <clears throat> if we're being honest about it, even the defense attorneys don't presume innocence when somebody comes in to your office. So let's be honest about it. That's all. Next. <clears throat> okay. So let's talk about what's going on behind the scenes and why. Next slide. Whenever there's a potential for a uh, death penalty to be claimed, and this was obvious right up front, first of all, the state has to have the death penalty in its statutes. It has to be an option for them. Um, and then when you get a case like this, immediately a death qualified attorney is appointed <clears throat> and they're guided in each. I'm sorry, I got a frog in my throat. And Lou's not here to help me with my coffee. So we That's can okay. go one night. Shout out to Lou, by the way. We miss you. Mm. Lou's taking care of family business. <clears throat> yeah, she's taking care of her mother who had some. Uh, but, but you have Butters who's yes, down Butters. below you. And, and yeah. Buddy just jumped off the couch. So, hey, Butters, could you go get me a coffee? <laughs> uh, sorry, that's not happening. <clears throat> so, so, they are guided by uh, the ABA guidelines. And anybody, it's online if you want to look up what the guidelines are. It's almost 200 pages of guidelines, so it's a lot to read. And the case law behind that is probably 10 or 15,000 pages. Um, but at least you can go in there and see uh, what the requirements are for a capital defense attorney. And that's what is required to be appointed in this case. And not just an attorney, but a team. And let's get into that and why that's important. I'm putting my glasses on because I can't see. Please. Um, Okay, so there you see on A1, uh, defense team should of no fewer than two attorneys, two qualified death penalty attorneys. And there's only 29 people who are qualified to do this in the state of Idaho. So two of those 29 are going to be on this case. There's going to be at least another two attorneys assisting, more junior attorneys assisting. There's going to be a fact investigator, somebody like you, Chris, a homicide investigator who's going to be on there. There's going to be a mitigation specialist who's going to help with the uh, sentencing aspect of it. There's going to be a mental health professional. There are going to be all sorts of support staff. So it's going to be a big team and that team is already in place. And that's the way it is when a death case comes up, that team gets appointed immediately. They start working immediately. And we already saw that in this case. Next slide. Oh, no, I really can't read it. Yeah, <laughs> who made the slide? All right, well, let me blow through it then because nobody else can read it either, probably. So, in order to be qualified as a capital defense attorney, you have to have a lot of trials, you have to have regular murder trials, you have to have already sat through a capital murder trial from start to finish, from jury selection to sentencing. Uh, you have to then be approved by the state Supreme Court. There are a bunch of things you have to do. You have to be an expert in homicide in order to be qualified as a capital defense attorney. Um, and that's important. And I'll tell you why here in a minute. So next slide. Yep. We just talked about that. Next slide. That's all the stuff. Oh, yeah. We're going to have um, crime scene techs. They're going to be. <clears throat> anybody who's not automatically appointed, uh, they're going to file a, a motion <laughs> to have the court to make the taxpayers pay for all of these experts, right? And so that's just what happens. And what, what's a mitigation specialist? What do they do? So uh, the mitigation specialist is a specialist and generally a mental health professional, but not the kind of person who's going to testify at trial. It's the kind of person that can help you identify potential um, mitigating factors, such as a difficult childhood, 
uh, mental illness. And if they need, if we need to get a mental health professional, then they will go and look and help us find one. Uh, but they are, their only job is to work on mitigation. It's not guilt innocence. They only work uh, on the sentencing aspect. And many times in these cases, then we might as well get into it. The sentencing, the mitigation aspect will drive the case. So it sounds like this case is very strong. So what they're going to want to do is what they call front load mitigation. So they're going to want to bring that sentencing information, the mitigation into the actual case uh, for guilt and innocence. Interesting. Yeah. They will start bringing all of that stuff in to prepare the jury. So when they get to sentencing, the jury has been softened up. They've already been trained a little bit so that they don't want to give the death penalty. So uh, it's called front loading mitigation uh, for, for capital defense attorneys. We do it all the time. Um, especially when you have a case and this may be one of those where the facts are just overwhelming, you're not going to win. Right. And so you don't want to put your credibility all out there on a guilt innocence. And then when you show up at sentencing, you start talking again, nobody's listening because everybody thinks you're a lying piece of crap. So you need that mitigation specialist. Oftentimes, the mitigation specialist will drive the case more than the fact investigator, more than the attorneys, right? It's the mitigation that will drive this case. And you're going to see that in this case. Um, and we'll get into that in a minute. But that's what's going to drive this case ultimately, uh, assuming that the DNA turns out to be a solid match, because there's no way he's going to be able to explain how the DNA, his DNA got on the knife sheath that was used to murder these people. Yeah, um, on the button. And, yeah. and and interesting thought there uh, with that real fast is you mentioned uh, a forensic anthropologist and a lot of smaller agency or you know a lot of lesser cases because of the magnitude of this case four victims etc um, and it's obviously a death penalty a lot of other cases wouldn't have all of these types of experts but no. because the death penalty is on the table. Uh, you would have brought in, you would bring in a forensic anthropologist to to match the wounds versus just an ME, right? Oh, yeah. And and yeah, both sides, they're going to mirror each other. If there's a forensic anthropologist on the prosecution, the defense will ask for that and they will ask for the government to pay for it. And by the government, I mean you, the taxpayers. These cases are incredibly expensive. Um, they, so. and tell that tell that one story. I, I, it's hysterical. I, I don't want to sidetrack you though, but I think it's yeah. hysterical. You walked into the courtroom, you know, you had you had your own deal going, and you looked at everybody and went, "Oh, we're okay, we're good." Oh <laughs> no, that was that was. You don't, uh, don't go into details, obviously. Okay, I'm not going to go into details, but I'm just going to say it was a um, essentially an organized crime deal where there were a bunch of people that were charged. And I mean, the evidence was, there was a lot of evidence, a big investigation. Uh, so I walk into courtroom, not knowing all of this, but when I walked in the courtroom, uh, I looked around and I saw 10 of the top defense attorneys in the state. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> things are going to be okay. And they just overwhelmed the prosecution. And in this case, it's going to be very similar. You're going to have a lot of top-notch defense attorneys working on this case. And Ann so, Taylor is one of them. She is, she, this isn't her first rodeo. Yeah. No, I think so far, and I'll explain to you why she's doing what she's doing. Okay. So one thing is if you notice that the defense had access to the crime scene. So one of the requirements, and this again is out of the ABA guidelines for capital defense attorneys. One of the requirements is, that you must reinvestigate the case from start to finish, regardless of confessions, regardless of the overwhelming weight of the evidence, uh, regardless of anything, you are required to go back in and do the police job from start to finish all over again, starting from scratch. And even if the client says, I don't want you to do that, you're not let off the hook by the ABA uh, because they are telling you no. Regardless, I don't care if the client says, I've had clients tell me, don't investigate, don't talk to these people, don't talk. I've had clients 
that would call the people and tell them, don't talk to Billy Little, right? Um, because they wanted to be executed. <clears throat> so free me or fry me. That's what a lot of them will say. Um, so, but that's what they're, they're doing right now. That's why you're seeing what you're seeing. That's why they file a motion or they talk to the court and the prosecutor and they get what's called preservation of evidence, right? So that they can get in there with their own team and look at the crime scene, have their own crime scene techs, uh, reconstruction experts. They will have a homicide investigator just like you, Chris, um, that goes in there. Um, I've walked through, you know, a lot of gruesome crime scenes and they have to preserve that. And we really, I mean, it's very expensive. Like these cases on the defense side cost several million dollars just for the defense side, for the prosecution. Now you're upwards of 10 million or more just to prosecute these cases. So we want to get it right. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, the cost of these cases are astronomical, but that's what it costs if you want to kill somebody. And I think probably most of America, if this guy's guilty, wouldn't mind him getting the needle or however they kill people up there. So, um, but so you know, it, it, it potentially the strategy right now, based on what you're laying out for us, there's only 29 qualified capital mm -hmm. attorneys, defense attorneys in the, yep. in the state. And it looks like he's going to get two of them. And it looks like he already has one. No, no, he's got two. She, she's the only one that showed, trust me. <laughs> I can okay. tell you what's going on behind the scene. So okay. she is out there on point. She's already got her team together. That's why she was able to go to the crime scene with her crime okay. scene reconstructionist, with her crime scene tech, um, with her homicide investigator. Um, they're taking, they're doing exactly what you would do on the other side. Um, right. They're making sure that the investigation was done correctly. And really for the ultimate punishment, that's what we want. We want to make sure that it's true that the guy really did it before we, you know, take somebody's life. We need to make sure that it was done right, that there's not any hanky panky. Um, and so, no, she, she showed up. So for example, today she showed up and she was by herself. Now there's, she got at least 10 to 15 people behind her, um, who you didn't see in the courtroom. You know, yeah, you might see, go ahead. You might see glimpses of them when the news goes out there and they see people walking in and out of that house from the defense team. Um, but those are those are her people, and she's doing exactly what I would be doing right now if I was her. Yeah, I saw two of the investigators even sitting in the hearing today behind her, just yeah. sitting there, you know. Yeah. And so, and, and you're a thousand percent right. They were already out there, you know, videotaping, recreating, um, and, uh, you know, going at it. So, um, yeah. so let's talk about the, the extradition. Uh, walk us through where you think his head is and uh, why it went so quickly. Yeah. So uh, extradition, you're going to fight extradition if it is, um, for example, they got the wrong guy. Like, oh, they wanted a different Brian Cover. This is, you got the wrong dude, right? So Saudi, some other dude did it. <laughs> um, they've arrested the wrong dude. I'm not going to go sit in jail while they figure out that I'm not the right guy. Right. But that's clearly not the case here. Um, sometimes if you, and this is international extradition. So let's say you're in a country where there is no death penalty. Uh, they have a rule that they won't extradite people back to a place where there is a death penalty because they consider that in, in their system as cruel and unusual punishment. So you can fight extradition on that. Sometimes people, Let's say he had run off to, I don't know, Mexico and said, hey, I'm fighting extradition because they're going to execute me. And Mexico says, yeah, we don't want to do that. Um, so that can be, oh, you go Sorry, back. I hit, the wrong, I, I hit the wrong button. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so, but the defense team, uh, they want to get their hands on that discovery as soon as possible. In order to do that, they got to get their client back to Idaho. Um, so that they can start getting discovery and disclosure from the government. They want to see how strong the state's case is now, even as they reinvestigate the case. 
But they also, and you'll see if you read the ABA guidelines, they have a requirement to build a relationship with the client and his family. So they are currently doing that. Trust me, the mitigation specialist has already reached out to his family members, already talking, uh, because, you know, when you get to mitigation, it's going to be, you know, don't kill him because he didn't get a pony for Christmas, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, or sometimes they're physically or sexually abused as a child. And um, they're going to be family dynamics that the mitigation specialist is out there right now uh, talking to the family. And, and the family doesn't realize it. You know, they're, she's probably talking to mom and dad like, oh, hey, how are you doing? We're here to help, blah, blah, blah. And the family thinks we're there to help. And then you get to trial and they just talk about how horrible his childhood was and how horrible the parents were and how, you know, there's a history of mental health in that family, mental health problems in that family. And he never had a chance. Um, his options were limited when he grew up, blah, blah, whatever. Um, is that a strategy? Is that a strategy then? Oh yeah. Yeah. They are right now, that defense team right now is out there trying to build relationships and talk to relatives talk to friends, talk to neighbors, find out, okay, what was going on when this kid was growing up? Why is he a little wacky? You know, what's, you know, what are his mental health problems? They're looking for medical records, school records. Um, they're getting all kinds of information right now that can be used as mitigation to try to save his life when it gets down to sentencing. And again, once they get all that stuff, let's say, Let's say he has a diagnosis. Let's say he's OCD or whatever that he has a diagnosis or there's something in his school records that he was put on some kind of plan or he had some problems. Um, maybe then they say, well, why don't we try to use some sort of guilty except insane defense during the guilt innocence portion of trial? That allows us to bring all the psychology stuff in early in the case. That's that front loading I was talking about. And so they may have that strategy. You may see that in this case, that they have a defense that's not really a defense, but it's setting up uh, them trying to save his life. But it yeah. allows them, go ahead. No, I'm sorry, I interrupted. I... No, it allows them to bring evidence in that ordinarily wouldn't be admissible, um, but it, you got to find a way to make it admissible so you can get it in front of the ju jury early as possible. Got a front load. You know, what's interesting is Idaho does not have an insanity defense. They they basically, to your point, put them in front of all the docs and then they, you know, tuck them away uh, for a little bit, you know, evaluations and et cetera. And then they find them competent and they bring them back and uh, you can't plead insanity. Yeah, the um, most states have gone away from what we have traditionally thought of as the insanity defense. So they now have, there's two things that can happen. One, you can have a competency evaluation. So the person can say, well, I'm not competent to stand trial. So they'll send them to RTC, restoration to competency. So they can go, okay, we'll go teach them what a lawyer is and teach them what a judge is and teach them what a jury is. And then once we fix him, we'll send him back and he can stand trial. Now, that being said, you can still in the States plead guilty except insane. Right. It's different. It's the old, in the old days, if you were insane, they had to turn you loose. Right. Nowadays, the answer for guilty, except insane, if you are found guilty, except insane, you will get the same sentence as you would if you had just pled guilty. But in a death penalty case, you cannot be executed. So that's another way to save their lives. So you can play around with that. And every state has that option for you. Um, the Supreme Court has decided that you can't execute mentally uh, incompetent people or insane people. Um, so that's a, that's a game that is played and will be played in this case. And, but, and it's a it's a chess move, right? I mean, for mm -hmm. the defense and the prosecution, there, you, there's everybody's moving different different pieces of the puzzle. Yep. So the only thing, and she's done an excellent job. Like I said, the defense attorney's done exactly what I would be doing. Um, so she's doing a great job. The only slight, I don't know if it's a criticism, but maybe a practice that I would not have done. And I do this. Uh, I mean, I did it on the case you and I were just working on this past year. Um, I don't allow them to make statements about their own mental competency. So in order to be extradited, he had to say, 
oh no, I'm competent to waive extradition. So he had to make a statement about his mental competency. Uh, I never let them do that. Uh, maybe she has her reasons for it. I'm obviously not in charge of this case, so I'm not trying to second guess her, but I don't ever do that. Um, because later on, if she's got to come back and say, well, you know, he's not mentally competent for X, Y, and Z. Well, like, well, really? Because he said he was, <laughs> and he said, you know, he was competent to waive um, extradition hearing. So what's changed, right? So you don't want to throw him back in your face. I'm very so careful. I'm just going to jump on that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just, when I do these, I'm very careful about that. I don't care. Um, and in the military, it becomes a problem because they can order you to have a mental health evaluation. Um, but I fight that even in the court martials. But in the civilian world, that it, it's basically the same, same chess move as a whole. Uh, in the civilian world, it is, uh, you've got, you got a stronger hand on the defense side. Uh, the military can make you do things that in civilian world, they can't make you do. It's a slightly different system. Um, but it doesn't matter to me. I'm not letting my client talk. So you can all go pound sand if I'm the defense attorney. Uh, yeah. Now, what statement did he make when he got arrested? Did you arrest anyone else? Right. Uh, stupid, 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 stupid. Like I said, he thinks he's smart. He thinks he's smarter than everybody in the room. You can see when he is in there talking to his, uh, I don't want to talk about that just yet. Um, when he's in the courtroom with his attorney, you can see that he thinks he's smarter than her as well. Um, he just has that piece of him, right? He, just, he Kid doesn't own a mirror, right? He doesn't have a good uh, self-reflection. He's not self-aware. Right. He's he's mentally ill. Clearly, uh, he's not aware that he's mentally ill. He's just um, thinking that he's so smart. So he comes out and he tells the police, did you arrest anyone else? Hey, partner, there ain't anybody else. Right. But he thinks he's going to outsmart the police. Right. That was a dumb thing. And why? Because now next slide. Why is that a dumb thing to say? Because that is really not what an innocent person would say. Right. If you arrested me for that murder up there, I'd be like, what What the hell are you talking about? I, was, I wasn't there. I didn't do it. I don't know what you're talking about. You got the wrong guy. Right. I, my first thing out of my mouth wouldn't be, did you arrest anyone else? Right. That's a statement that's going to be thrown back in his face at trial. Um, yeah, that's going to be a, that's going to be an uphill run for his yeah. attorneys. Now, in, in your experience, I mean, you've not you've done it on both both yeah. sides of the coin. Tell me about these personalities in the courtroom when you deal with them behind the scenes before you even get out there. Uh, I think it'd be interesting for our audience to understand, you know, we know he's obviously the smartest guy in the room, but you, you and I have talked behind the scenes about this. Uh, share your thoughts on how you handle these guys. On him? Well, if when I know how, not him necessarily, but in your experience, with all your experience, I mean, well, go ahead. You want, so now I'm giving away trade secrets. Well, don't give away too many, but yeah, but give me <laughs> well, some. You know, well, I'm just generally, it's uh, you have to approach it almost as a therapeutic relationship where it is no matter what they say. Uh, you have to act like what they just said was the most normal thing in the world and that, oh, you know what? Yeah, any I can understand that. And so it's a very non-judgmental, therapeutic thing because you want to gain their trust because you're going to need their cooperation, especially if at some point there's an offer on the table to save their life. So if the prosecutor says, for whatever reason, you know what? to save the victims' families from going through this, to save the taxpayer, you know, millions of dollars, uh, we'll let you spend the rest of your life in prison as opposed to executing you. Now, I don't know if that's going to be politically feasible in this case, but if they come up with that, you're going to have to go back to this kid who thinks he's smarter than everybody and say, hey, this is absolutely in your best interest. You need to take this. And if they don't trust you, uh, if you haven't built that relationship like the ABA guidelines require, um, then they're just going to tell you to pound sand. So yeah, I mean, 28 years old. 
He's he's 28 years old, and he is acting like he's the smartest, you know, yeah. cookie in the shed here. And uh, when we, you and I both know, you know, that it's not even close. Um, do you, how do you think he's going to play it? Oh, he he's gonna he's gonna go for innocence. I mean, I know his type, right? You know his type too. He's gonna go for innocence. Uh, at some point, if the defense attorneys uh, and they are very experienced, if they've done their job, they're gonna get him off of that ledge. Uh, they're gonna get him to come around, uh, but it's gonna take a while. So you'll see in Idaho, there's a speedy trial, right? You have the right to go to trial in six months uh, if you. If there's if it's a weak government case, it's a weak prosecution case. The defense team will push this thing to trial as quickly as possible. If if it is a strong prosecution case, uh, they're going to take their time. They're going to slow the the game down. This is going to take years, right? Because they're going to need to get evaluations. They're going to need to get witnesses. They're going to have to. They're going to start slow rolling early on, and especially with a guy like this. You're going to need more than six months just to develop a relationship where they're going to trust you enough to spend the rest of their life in prison without running the risk of being executed. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I'm just going to put this up real fast. It says looks to, uh, is 28, looks 48, IQ eight. I don't know. <laughs> I don't. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. <laughs> Good, good, good comment. Let's good see comment. here. He's, he's probably, I mean, if we had to put a number on, I'd put him, you know, 100, 105 IQ. I mean, pretty average oh, he's guy. Got a degrees. I mean, it, uh, yeah, but know. I mean, you can get that through. He's He's got OCD, so he's going to study like crazy. He's going to read a lot. He's a loner. Uh, you can teach. I've seen people on death row who have, taught themselves to appear to be very smart just by an enormous amount of reading. So he's yeah. going to be that guy. Yeah. But if you act, ask him to analyze something that's in depth, you notice he's not an engineer. He's not a doctor. He's not doing any kind of complex uh, analysis of anything, he's basically reading and studying criminals, right. Which is his fetish. So yeah, yeah not a bright guy. Yeah. And, um, we know how those guys can uh, explode uh, because of some of the other things. And Dr. Bracado nailed this guy the other oh. day. And if you, if you want to see what one of these guys looks like, go watch the video I did of an interview with a kid by the name of Brandon Wilson. Uh, it's in my playlist. The no, kid Bracado, had a nice. Go ahead, Billy. No, Bracado nailed it. The guy nailed it. Um, and when you listen to it, you're like, you're thinking, oh, did they already arrest him and he already know this? No, no, no. This was way before they arrested him. I mean, he just absolutely nailed this guy. Yeah. Um, Gary, Gary's amazing like you. And uh, that's why, you know, I'm just, I'm grateful that you're here tonight. And just so everybody knows, Billy and I were both part of the cold case foundation. Uh, Dr. Bricado is Dr. Ann Burgess, Dr. Petreka, who was here the other night. Uh, this is what we do behind the scenes. A lot of the public doesn't know what we do, but, you know, just so you know, I mean, we're we're actively working real cases. Brilliant, uh, brilliant people, brilliant minds there you got. I mean, it's just, yeah. <laughs> I, and, I always learn something when I listen to these people. They're amazing. But they're really this smart. guy, yeah, this guy, um, he's a very simple guy. So he's going to be easily um, offended. He's going to have very thin skin. And that's probably my guess is that's what they're going to find about this is that there was maybe some rejection or somebody laughed at him or whatever. And then he, you know, got angry and was going to get back. I'm very thin skinned, very dumb, um, you know, OCD. Uh, and you look at him and then you're going to trace back in the family. You're going to find the same thing. It's um, there's his dad riding with him. Um, pulled over a couple of times and they used to. I mean, that's probably a pretext stop, but, you know, what's that? It was. Yeah. The feds, they had it. We call it a whisper stop, right? Remember? Yeah. And uh, where there's a surveillance taking place. Uh, they were on to this guy on the 29th of November. So they really started to flush him pretty quickly. 
uh, within a couple of weeks of the homicides. And what, uh, what the public doesn't understand sometimes is, you know, stops like this, this is what, where you, you, you call up, you have a whole surveillance team. I remember we followed a guy one time, um, he, he had killed an LAPD officer, uh, by name Verna and, um, they had a well, they had a whole surveillance team. Anyway, the guy turns uh, eastbound on Interstate Eight, headed towards Phoenix. And when they pulled into a gas station and asked directions, uh, when they pulled out, uh, there were probably you know fifteen undercover vehicles <laughs> that, that had pulled in around them, right? And there were two helicopters up above them. And they had no idea what was happening. Long story short, they ended up taking him down on the freeway. And uh, so my guess, and I said this early on, the guy would come back to the scene. He knew the, he knew the neighborhood, knew the environment. He would be, you know, creeping early on these, on these poor victims. Uh, and that he would, you know, Dr. Bricado just tied his, uh, his personality into it. And I, I'm, I know we're going to find some, you know, some real problems with uh, peeping Tom and all that other stuff, even though he doesn't look at, uh, he does look at, I mean, look at those eyes. I mean, he's, he go ahead. Yeah. So, and, and you know, this Chris, now I'm out of my lane, I'm in your lane. So you can well, correct me when I'm wrong, but uh, I suspect one of the reasons why they needed this, these pretext stops in, and the body cams, is to see if there are defensive wounds on his hands, arms. Um, and so there you can see uh, his hand is exposed. Uh, you don't really see anything. I can't tell if his hand is swollen, you know, uh, mm -hmm. it may be. I, don't, I haven't seen his regular hand, but he's a thin guy. That hand looks a little swollen, but, you know, we'll get that out. But that's why it's so important. And if I can show you the knife again, that's why it's so important to have this blade guard. Right. That prevents. I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember the O.J. Simpson, but uh, he had sliced his hand. Right. Because the it gets slippery with the blood. But this blade guard will keep your hand from sliding down the knife. And you notice that he doesn't have that. So for killing people, um, this is the knife to have. Right. That's the only reason you would have that knife. But that blade <laughs> guard prevented probably some uh, wounds from his own knife. Uh, but well, let, let's, and that's a good point, Billy, uh, break it, break down, you know, malice of forethought and mens rea for people so that they understand those elements um, of what so, these guys have to prove. Yeah, so, so, yeah. So mens rea, that's just the mental uh, state of mind that is required for, let's say, um, first degree murder. So what would the mens rea? It would have to be intentional murder, right? Sometimes you can have felony murder so that if they're doing a bank robbery and somebody gets killed, you know, they should have been able to foresee the fact that that's a dangerous thing to do with a gun. And so somebody could get killed. So maybe they didn't intentionally kill them, but that's the, the mens rea portion is the mental state. Was it intentional? Was it reckless? You know, was he just getting drunk and driving around doing a hundred miles an hour being reckless? Yeah. He didn't mean to kill anybody, but come on, man, you, <laughs> you're going to kill somebody. Was it just negligent? Were you just stupid about it? Uh, so the mens rea just talks about the mental state of the person that is required for that element of the crime. And so for uh, this one will be intentional. He meant to do it. Um, it's, premeditated malice of forethought, meaning that uh, he had a dark heart, that he wanted to, them to die. He went there for the purpose of killing them and he did kill them. So he meant to do it and he did it. <coughs> so there you go. You all right? You got a bone in that water? I swallowed the water. <laughs> all right. Well, let me just say this, that um, when the police asked the father, um, they, I guess they asked both of them, you know, where are you coming from? And the father started answering where they're coming from. And then this idiot starts interrupting them. Like, don't, don't tell them where we're coming from. Like his, everything that he does is just dumb and guilty. Well, you know, interesting point about that. When I was watching this body cam video, you see them 
<clears throat> the father starts giving the narrative and and you know the suspect is is looking to innocent till proven guilty is looking at the dad and there's almost one point it looks like where they both make eye contact and the son is like oh okay we're going this way you know up here mm -hmm. right and it's just a subtle it's a subtle eye contact between the two of them as if you know there's something more there there's you know and and everybody go watch it again and there's a just a split second where they look at each other and he's like oh okay that's he's going that direction that's where he goes and it's almost like he capitalizes on that into the narrative but yeah. they don't talk about it you know daddy is going to be brought into this at some point so i think so too not not yeah. that he's involved but at some point there has to be knowledge of a little bit deeper than you know they're going to ask about the airline tickets they're going to ask yep. about the cell information they're going to ask about the vehicle uh i mean you know in this particular traffic stop he's talking about yeah you know there's a, a mass shooting at going on at wsu uh when you know the rest of the country is going you know there were four students killed at ui right next door uh and it's yeah. almost like you know nice deflection you know curveball i don't think that's going to work but uh, yeah, yeah no. he's an interesting cat yeah well he again he thinks he's so smart and he doesn't he has no self-awareness to realize that he's not that smart uh, so for example when he went out to vegas to visit with his uh family i think it was a wedding or something out there and with the aunt and then the, he wouldn't eat food cooked in a pot that ha had previously had meat in it and he made them buy new pots and pans which is just ridiculous, but this tells you that he thinks he's smarter than his aunts and uncles, he's smarter than his dad, he's smarter than the police, and he's smarter than the lawyer. And truth is, you're not smarter than any of them, right? So you're just, there's something wrong with you, kid. So Yeah, I, I said on the, I was on the Nancy Gray show, and she asked me about this, and I, about the traffic stuff, and I said, well, <clears throat> there's obviously a couple reasons going on here which the rest of the panel we were all discussing was obviously the video, you know, let's see what kind of injuries, if any, okay, get a look at his face. And then also I made the comment that, you know, they probably want a, a visual of some sort too. Maybe there's a witness. And this was before the affidavit came out today. And cause my thinking was, you know, they're getting up close and personal with this guy. They don't ask for driver's license registration proof of insurance it's like hey do you got id okay and it's like yeah. you know what's wrong with that protocol right um and so well, go ahead well the, but that just points to i mean, like wouldn't you find that odd if you got pulled over that you didn't get asked that but that that doesn't even set off anything in his brain like hey wait a minute this is a pretext stop yeah like, exactly he's just not getting it so exactly exactly um anyway so i thought man maybe they're trying to get some uh picture for a a, a lineup or something maybe mm -hmm. there's a lineup somewhere and now we discover that uh, the victim who survived uh actually saw the guy so yep. you know but because you and i both know you've got to eliminate everybody in his circle everybody to that had knowledge and that would be the opportunity time the opportune time to take the picture of the dad and say you know it's a current picture and just kind of show the witness does this look like the guy you know yeah and you yeah. could even if you're doing a lineup you could even say get them to describe the mask put a mask on them yeah and you're, exactly. it's not going to be you know it's not like dna but you could say yeah that could be him you know this is a circumstantial case that could be enough you know just another piece another brick in a wall yeah so the, yeah, they the, could be the only thing that didn't give me the warm and fuzzy was the fact that they make eye contact pretty quickly. Uh, and it just looked like, okay, there's more conversation going on than we know here. And, and that's just my thought process. And I hope I'm wrong a thousand percent. Well, um, you, you're kind of, and there, you, there you go. The, um, you look at the hands, um, you can see if there's any injuries or not. I couldn't tell. Um, it, it's hard to say. I mean, I had some doctors weigh in on, and you know, they was 50, 50. So, 
but the good news is uh, they've got that resolved now uh, because, <laughs> you know, he's uh, that that single source DNA that you pointed out, Billy, on the on the snap. Uh, yeah. Show everybody that snap again, because we got 7,000 people in here now, and you showed it earlier, but we've yeah. got a lot more this, people here. This is this is the camera. Let me put the knife in, then I'll pull it out again. We'll do the same so thing. This is the exact type of weapon and sheath that is mentioned in the affidavit. This is the USMC K-Bar that, that he used to kill. You see the Marine Corps emblem on it, USMC. Uh, this is developed, again, for... Uh, the military for fighting purposes, for killing. There's a snap on it that has that single source DNA. Don't know if it's on the inside or outside of that snap, but clearly he touched it at some point. Now the defense is going to say, well, you know, maybe he touched it and some other guy took it out of his house, right? And then went to kill it. And well, the problem is single source, right? So what the other guy... <laughs> didn't get his DNA all over it. No, no victim's DNA on it. Um, that's the Marine Corps uh, K-Bar knife. Seven and those inches. of you that don't know, Billy, if you're just joining us, Billy was a former Marine Corps officer, uh, combat veteran. So he knows the game and he knows these knives. And, and if you're just joining with us, he's also handled uh, at least 17 capital murder cases uh, across this country. And the reason I have him here tonight, he's not only a colleague uh, on the Cold Case Foundation with me, but he is probably, uh, in my opinion, the one of the brightest legal minds in this country. And uh, it's a real treat to have him here uh, where you guys are going to be able to have a chance to ask him some questions. I've been tagging your questions. I got 24 of them up okay. so far. So well, let's go through the rest of this. We're almost done. Yeah. And then we'll get to the questions. Roger that. Um, Okay, then we got the close-up, but you also see the eyes, you see the face. Um, of course, in hindsight, everything looks more guilty than it probably would if you just met him. But um, you put that guy on a chain of uh, 12 other people up in the jury box, chained together. You can kind of pick out, okay, there's something a little off about this, dude. Just look in the eyes. I don't know. We used to play that game. We'd try to pick out the criminals on the chain. Um, so, yeah, it was... So the dad, he's got a lot of explaining to do, a lot of explaining to do, sir. Lucy. Um, Lucy, explain. Because you fly out there to help your son drive back. Um, you know that the country is looking for the car that you're in, uh, and you don't say anything about it, and your kid is clearly distressed. Um, he's trying to keep you from talking to the police about something and you're complying with him. Uh, this guy, he's got a lot of explaining to do. Um, but you know there was a shooting. Oh, yeah. No, you know there's a shooting, but the entire country is looking for the car that your butt is sitting in right now. And you don't have a thing to say about that. I, I Coincidentally, I saw somebody with the a uh, white Hyundai Elantra, I think that's what it was, uh, at the gas station the other day. And I looked at him and I said, you know, good thing they already arrested that guy because I would have turned you in right now. <laughs> he goes, I know, <laughs> I was getting nervous. <laughs> so everybody in the country knew. But but the person who was there, the person that did it, him and his dad didn't know. They Would they listen to music the whole ride home? Come on, man. Come on. Yeah, and get fear. stopped twice. Yeah. Yeah, nothing to see here. And and he's so dumb. He doesn't even figure out, hey, wait a minute. I've never been stopped for following too close. They didn't ask for my insurance. <laughs> like, he doesn't <laughs> figure it out. <laughs> yeah, so this is going to be the question, right? I, I, I believe right now there are investigative teams that have, you know, gone this way. And I, I mentioned this, you know, on the Nancy Gray show where the investigation is collapsed it's compressed where you and i both know what happens at that point you've got your team over here who is focused on the sun and now you have your peripheral teams i.e the cell phone analysis you know the all the things that are going on there and then you have all of these other interviews and that's why the fbi is so important right now because they have the resources you know to say hey we got a b c and d 
because everybody is running right now to get ahead of this defense team that's going to come right in and you know try to get a different narrative in relationship to what the facts potentially could be. Am I off base there? What do you think? No, no, you're right. And so the dad is going to be an important play for the prosecution because they're going to drop some charges on him at some point. And then you're going to squeeze the kid. You're going to let your old man go to prison for something stupid. Do you, you, think, you think they could? Do you oh, yeah. honestly? Yeah, really? I think they can squeeze the old man. And then because they're going to want him to be a witness. They're going to want him to talk and he's going to say, I'm pleading the fifth. And then they're going to work out a deal and maybe it's a grand jury. Um, but they're going to have a judge tell him, no, sir, you will answer the question. Um, so, yeah, they're going to use the old man for sure. And they should. Yeah. And they, and they may not hook him up, but they're going to put him under a little pressure. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, but what will the defense do? What, what, where's, where's, what's the defense going to do with the dead? And the family. I, I don't think anybody else is involved at all, right? I, I think this kid did it, but I think there's some question marks as to what he told other people post-homicide. Now, the defense is going to be in a position of trying to attack the bias, the pressure, the coerced statement of, okay, yeah, well, you say that you guys talked about this stuff, but you didn't initially say that. You said that after they told you that they were going to send you to jail, if you didn't tell them something, you knew what you needed to tell them, didn't you? And the dad's going to want to play along with the defense. So he's going to say, yeah, I was scared. Yeah, I told them what they wanted to hear. So um, it's not 100% for the prosecution, but it's definitely a way to squeeze them. But the defense is going to attack the the dad's statement as, as bias um, and coerced. Interesting. And, uh, how will the prosecution play it with, uh, uh, well, when they, when he gets on the stand, where would you go with the father if he got on the stand as a character witness for Brian? Well, now he's, you're talking, now you're talking about sentencing. So you're talking about mitigation, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, but if he testifies at trial, you have to, you don't let the defense take the first shot at the bias and, and uh, coercion. You you talk about that right in your direct. Well, you know, you didn't want to tell us anything, did you? No, but you did, right? Because the judge had to make you tell us this because you didn't want to tell us anything. You make it look as though he's biased for the other side while you at the same time, you're drawing the sting from the cross-examination because the cross-examination will then get up there and go, well, you know, you didn't want to say anything. Well, the jury's like, well, shit, we already heard that. You know, you're going over, <laughs> you're replowing the same row, right? We've heard this. So you're going to want to draw the sting. Now, when you get to sentencing, uh, the prosecution is going to say, it's obvious he loves his child. You know, he's a parent. Um, he's biased. He doesn't want his child to die. And, you know, what parent would want their child to die? You know, that's just a normal reaction. And I'm pretty sure that the parents of these dead children didn't want their kids to die either. Um, but the dad's in here crying for his kid. Did he shed one tear for these four dead college kids? No. So let's get to the uh, questions, Bill. You, you good? Okay. Ready. Let's roll. Okay. Um, let's see here. So I to be here. How much have I learned it? Do you think they will give him a bond on his next court date? No, no, there won't be. Um, he's, they, they could have, sometimes if you wanted to get him out, something called proof evident presumption great hearing. Uh, so you have a bond hearing and then you're forced the government to put on a little bit more evidence than you would to show them more of their hand. But that's more of a tactic just to get the government to show more of their strategy for trial. Um, so you have a bond hearing, um, then you have a proof evident presumption, great hearing. Uh, okay. So what's the bill? Basically the evidence would you advise him to take the plea deal? Uh, thank you for another great show. Oh, thanks Katie Burke. Yeah, absolutely. So your responsibility as a capital defense attorney, once death is on the table, uh, your job is to save their life. That's it. If they come on the thing and they say, well, here's, uh, I'm going to answer this. <laughs> Okay. I don't care. Um, but your job is to go in there and say, um, 
yeah, you know what? There's an opportunity to save your life. You don't want to sit in that little box in isolation the rest of your life. So you're you always advise them to take the deal unless they're they're innocent, right? Then you would. So, so Billy, in the thousands of cases that you've worked, and uh, um, how many times do you ever see family members know exactly what went down? Oh my God! Oh my God! I had a case <laughs> a stabbing. Not 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 as bad as this one, but pretty bad stabbing. And uh, the kid was like, well, uh, you know, my mom is was there and she's going to come in. It was a party. Um, she's going to show exactly how it is that, you know, it was impossible that uh, I did this. Um, Where's your proof? Well, <laughs> yeah. You know, here here's the proof, uh, Cheryl. Well, how many murders have you put in prison? So, so. Anyway, so I, I bought the BS, you know, and I, I listened to the guy and um, I put the mother on the stand, had the diagram up. Cool. And I realized as she was testifying, she was explaining exactly where he grabbed the kitchen knife, exactly how he said, I was like, oh, my God, this is not going well. <laughs> um, yeah, we're not saying that the father did it. Let's make that clear oh. again to everybody. We know who did it i.e. innocent till proven guilty in this in a court yeah. of law. We're just yeah. saying that maybe there's others that do know, and it looked like the father's the first one sitting in the front seat with the son. So yeah. let's see yeah. how that how that unfolds. Go ahead. Yeah, maybe, the cops maybe, thought he maybe, knew something. Yeah, well, maybe the father didn't know anything. Maybe he drove all the way. Maybe he flew out to Idaho or Washington to pick up his son in that white Honda Elantra that everybody was looking for, drove 2,500 miles back. They didn't discuss anything. The police pulled him over. Everything was on the up and up. That is entirely possible. I don't think that's likely, but it's possible. So yeah. And, and please, I'm open to criticism and I'm open to being wrong. So I'm, I'm okay with that. Yeah, me yeah. too. Yeah. Let's see how it plays out. Great point, everybody. Uh, yeah. what, based on the evidence, would you advise him to take a plea deal? Yeah, I already covered that. Yeah, of course. As as a when you're charged with the death penalty, anything less than execution, you have to take it. So I imagine Ellie everywhere is checking past and recent crimes. Now they have his DNA. Prayers to the family. Thank you so much. I agree. Thank you, Diana. Good to see you again. My heart hurts for Dylan. Could his lawyers use her? And Dylan is the one of the sweet girls that survived uh, uh could his lawyers use her as part of their defense trying to throw her under the bus that is a good question um trying to throw her under the bus well, she's gonna, the one who saw the guy yeah 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 no what the defense will do that they're, i don't know if throwing it under the bus but they're going to point out did you ever see the movie my cousin Vinny? Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you remember when he's cross-examining the lady with the, with the glasses and then there was mud on the screen? And that's what they're going to do. They're going to cross-examine her and say, well, it was dark. You were half asleep. You, you know, you weren't trying to look at him. In fact, you know, when you saw him for a split second, um, then you shut the door or whatever. You were scared. You don't remember stuff, right, when you're scared. And then you may have an expert come in and talk about how hard it is to identify somebody, but really her, she's not picking him out of a lineup. She's just saying it was a tall, skinny guy with bushy eyebrows. Yeah. Uh, how long do you think it will take until the, if there is a trial, what's your guesstimate? Two years. And by the way, the judge uh, just put a uh, no contact order for the family, et cetera, for two years. Exactly. Right, there you go. Uh, if he does plea, where do you think he'll go? Um, if he pleads, yeah. uh, he's going to go to prison for the rest of his life. That's the only plea offer, if a plea offer is made. But again, I don't know if that's politically feasible in this case. A prosecutor may get unelected if they don't try to get this guy executed. So, uh, But the defense is going to do everything they can to get that plea offer. Um, so can do you believe you could oh, yeah. convict him? right now oh yeah 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 you don't you don't need the murder weapon um i mean you don't even need the body we've worked on those cases right no. um but uh sure is easier um but what they will do is they'll match that k bar to happy new year's thank you um, oh 
No, thank you, Krista. Go ahead. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Somebody asked a question about whoa, whoa, how to qualify as a capital qualified attorney. So that again, I would I would recommend that people look up the ABA guidelines, but let me just tell you generally what is required. You have to be an experienced uh, defense attorney. You have to have done, <clears throat> sorry, regular murder trials. You have to have sat through a capital trial from jury selection through sentencing. You have to uh, attend certain courses. Uh, then you have to request certification. Uh, you have to have ongoing training. Um, it's it's you're you're getting the best of the best for the for the defense attorneys. And I'm not saying that because I did it. I'm saying it because it's true. And that's you can see that already in this case. She's experienced. She's qualified. She knows what she's doing. And you got another devil dog here. Hoorah, devil dog. <laughs> <laughs> This is a great question here. Why did the police start the crime scene cleanup if they're required to preserve the scene? That is a great question. And I think that's going to come back and nip them, unfortunately. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So um, you almost, if you have, if you're a defense attorney uh, and your case sucks, you almost want them to start doing that because you're going to file that motion to preserve evidence uh, I've had it where they've uh, cremated bodies where you file motions to preserve the body and they've cremated it. Uh, you almost want them to prematurely start cleaning up uh, because that's going to give you some, not with the jury, but in motions, right? This is a verbal yeah. judo. Oh, yeah. mid Go ahead. Good. You verbal judo has good questions. I like those. Uh, mitigation is probably an expert jury select, so person who helps you select the jury. Yeah, absolutely. A mitigation specialist is a very specific specialty. They focus only on mitigating factors, meaning reasons to give mercy to this person, reasons not to execute them. So they will look things, like I said, difficult childhood, uh, mental health problems, um, coercion, dis duress. Um, they will go out and build relationships with the family. They'll build relationships with the uh, defendant. I've had cases where when it was all over, and it, it, like I say, it takes a couple of years, they built such strong relationships with the people that they're still getting you know, Christmas cards and I'm telling them to cut it off, but it's hard because it, it gets very personal. So, That's a well, thanks, Michelle. compliment. That's yeah, nice. Um, Let's see here. There, you just answered that one. Thank you so much for the support. We're grateful for that, you guys, very much. Hey, oh, look at that. Nice. It's very kind. Donna, would it benefit him to choose a speedy trial? It, it depends on the case. So I'm one of the very few attorneys who have demanded speedy trial in a capital murder case. Uh, usually you want some time for a lot of reasons. You've got a jury out there that's going to be all fired up right now. Um, you've got the prosecutor who can't stand the heat to give you a plea offer. You don't have a good relationship with your client, with the family. You haven't done the work that is required. Uh, if you're going to really do this trial, there's no way in heck you're going to get this done in six months. So you're going to need some continuances. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, I mean, we, oh gosh, I'm guessing, uh, probably took us nine months to get ready for that trial last year. And it wasn't, that wasn't even a, uh, capital murder. That was just your regular run of a mill murder. And it took us nine months of a lot of work. So do you think, uh, there'll be more information released? Well, there's a gag order now, right? So nobody can release anything which is, which is kind of nice. They're protecting the jury pool is what they're doing. They don't want a change of venue motion to be successful. Um, and that was well, the next question. Well, I'm, I'm psychic. I was, <laughs> 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 yes, absolutely. They're going to ask for a change of venue. Um, whether they get it or not, I don't know. The standard's pretty high, but, um, they might, I mean, it's pretty emotionally charged. But where are you going to go in this country where you're going to get people who haven't heard about the case? They, they might, if you burn through a couple of jury pools trying to select a jury, then you might be successful in a change of venue. Uh, but they're going to be reluctant to give them to that up front. 
but they might. I mean, it's a small community. Um, but it's going to be hard to get a, an unbiased jury pool up there. So, so Vesta says, you said the father didn't say anything yet. DM gets a free pass. Please explain. Thank you. So DM is the young girl. And so basically this is a comparative analysis question from Vesta, which is thank you so much. From the girl who witnesses the murderer in the house after just slaughtering four people to the father who drove with the murderer uh, 2,500 miles away. So uh, how do you want to do that analysis, Billy? <laughs> or did uh, I just do it? Just say that. Well, the, the, first of all, the girl is scared. And the girl absolutely saved her own life by shutting that door and locking it. Amen. Um, she'd be dead right now. She'd just be, there'd be five victims right now or six. Um, so, but he, he was not going to kill his father. Um, not that he doesn't have the personality for it, but his father was his, I mean, he ran home to mommy and daddy, right? Daddy, come and get me. I'm scared. I need help. So then his dad comes and gets him, drives him back. And then, you know. Yeah, I mean, it. isn't that a red flag in of itself? You know, a 20 year, 28 year old male calling his dad, you know, hey, come out here. And what he didn't need help transporting the car. He drove it. Somebody drove it there in the first place. Yeah. And then it had to go back. Right. So, yeah. And you get, get so when you get to trial, if this does go to trial, you're going to get a flight instruction. So leaving the scene, fleeing the scene is an indication of guilt, right? That's a standard instruction. So that the fact that he went from the crime scene back to um, Pennsylvania, that will be an indication of guilt. And they will get, the jury will be instructed on that. You can use that as evidence to show that he's guilty, that he fled the scene. Uh, concealment, um, concealing where he is, concealing that car, concealing whatever, uh, you're going to get a concealment instruction. So what they were doing were, and I mean, it's just common sense, but they put it in legal terms, but flight and concealment, those are indications of guilt, consciousness of guilt. So you're going to yeah, get those instructions. And that poor father, when they get him on the stand, um, they're going to grill him. That father will be grilled. I, I can assure you he'll be, he'll be toast on both sides of because the question's going to be, you know, well, you know, we, we have all the communication between you and your son uh, on text messages. And if he doesn't nail each one of those communications appropriately or correctly, they're going to, they're going to go after his uh, credibility. Yeah. Am I right, Billy? Yeah. Oh yeah. They're going to say, okay. And what they don't have in text, they're going to say, okay, you know, you guys talked for an hour the day after this happened. What did you guys talk about? I don't yeah. remember. Really? Okay. Yeah. And and doing that back to that other question about DM, doing a comparative analysis there, she's going to be on the stand and they're going to say, uh, had you, did you hear, did you see, you know, what were you thinking? What were you feeling? What was going through your mind? Oh, and by the way, you're only, you know, this age, you know, what, however old she is, I think she's like 20, maybe, yeah. Yeah. and yeah. pure yeah. terror. Uh, so it's not even it's not even close uh, connecting the two. And, you know, hopefully uh, the folks give her a break. Leave her alone. She's a yeah, young and, kid. And, and in a trial, you're going to have to. It depends on the father's demeanor, um, because some people might sympathize with them. Like, hey, you know what? He didn't have anything to do with this. He's got his kid. He loves his kid. He doesn't want his kid to be executed. So there are a certain number of people who are going to sympathize with him. And if he is a sympathetic figure at trial, you can't really attack him because that'll hurt your credibility. So it's going to depend on how he behaves and how he testifies as to whether how they decide to go after him or not. Yeah. And and let's let's also make it uh, point something out in today's ability to sit behind a keyboard and just type about people. When this case went down, there were two profiles of BK made just two. There's probably 30 now. Hey. You mean after the arrest? After the arrest. Of this, course. <laughs> this guy just slaughtered four people in a house 
<laughs> and all of these profiles start popping up as if he's some type of, you know, individual that they want to look up to. If, if you're in my chat and you're one of those people, please, you know, leave, <laughs> go, right. you know, because it's just, it's foolish. And to, and to be attacking this young girl uh, right now is, um, no, it's no. just, it's just not right. Right. This, now. this girl was in the zone of danger. She's very fortunate to be alive. She was a split second from being dead herself. The, the decision to shut and lock that door absolutely saved her life. And I, mm -hmm. if I were her, I'd be having nightmares right now. I'd be seeing a therapist um, because she came that close to death. Um, yeah, and she's probably got survivor's guilt that is just unbelievable. I can't even imagine what this yes. poor child's going through. And when I say poor child, this young woman, young yeah. lady. Let's, you know. let's address Lisa Black. She makes very good points here. Yep. Um, oh, wow. Life without parole. Yep. Uh, so much less expensive. Costs about, you know, 35 to 50 grand a year to house them for however long he's going to live. And trust me, he's going to be famous in prison and not in a good way. Uh, so, um, yeah, it's going to be a hell of a lot less expensive to give him LWAP than the death penalty. Um and the appeals, I mean, that number I gave you earlier, those two numbers, 2 million and 10 million, that doesn't include the appeals. Um, this is going to go on. It doesn't include the housing. It's a, yeah. Um, and it may be less traumatic to families when they go through. So the victims will have input, the victim's family, which in murder cases, those are the victims um, in addition to the deceased, but they will have input. They, if the, if the victim's families or if the victim's if they don't want to go through the trial, if they don't want this guy to be executed, they will absolutely be able to talk to the prosecutor and say, nope, I'm not playing that game. So. And, and well, well, be good, good point there. She yep. certainly did. And unfortunately, yes, she will have to testify in, in the trial and she'll actually have to be across from him and um, mm -hmm. point him out. Do yeah. I think this is his first killings? Yes, absolutely. I do believe these are his first killings. Uh, and Dr. Bracado, yeah. you know, pointed that out as well. And I think hundreds of people are, um, you know, this is a good point here from Tina. My 20 year old experience is a lot different from 20 year experience. So I don't really understand. Yep. I agree. I agree. Yep. Being 20 and being in the world, um, much right. different. Well, I'll, yeah. Well, I'll be said made a good point. Um, <laughs> which, <laughs> Don't play poker with Chief Fry. They were on him two weeks. His bluff game is strong, you know. Yep. Uh, good, I, I, good call, Willie. Yep. Because he was under a lot of pressure. Willie's got it right. He was under a lot of pressure to give the public something. And yeah, they, they were slings and arrows at him. Uh, yep. What's in the guy's head? Uh, yeah, great question, JPL. I think what's, uh, you know, what Dr. Uh, Bricado said, you know, that he's going to be, this guy will be a study for quite some time uh, if they don't, um, you know, put him, go ahead. I, I do not envy that defense team because I've had to deal with people like him. He is going to want to run the show. He is going to want to tell them how to do their work and that he, when they don't do what he wants them to do. He's going to try to fire them. Um, yeah. Uh, it's going so to be, it's going to be quite a, for, quite a, a problem for that defense team. A nightmare. Uh oh, I missed that last question. What Whoops. was the last question? Uh, I just tore it down. Uh -oh. Sorry. Hang on. Let me get it back up here. There it is. Okay. Uh, Nine mm -hmm. Yeah, no, we, Billy and I talked about that a little bit ago, and we got 8,100 people in here now. They just keep, they know you're here, and they're 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 coming over to listen to your opinion. Well, um, no, that's, um, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Now, uh, DM, uh, uh, yeah, and when she gets on the stand and testifies, she's going to cry. Um, it's going to be horrible, and the defense will not attack her. Um, they will softly cross her and ask her, was it dark, ma'am? Um, 
did you only see him for a split second? You weren't really paying attention. You couldn't make a diagram. Okay, well, thank you, ma'am. We're sorry. I know it's been traumatic for you. So it's going to be a real soft cross of her. You're not going to attack her. <laughs> What's she do? She's yeah, in the zone of danger. <laughs> that would be a problem. Do you think he had power over his professor? Uh, so, yes. And by the way, so you know, um, Dr. Picado and uh, Catherine have been in conversations before this came out um and the meaning the the moment she learned that he had been in custody and it was her student um and she's not willing or she's not ready at this point to talk about it but by i can assure you this uh she is having the same feelings uh of a lot of us here in total shock so uh, this guy was he's like i like I mentioned, I think he's going to be quite the study for a very long time in in the the system. Thank you for very much. Thank you, Lenny. Well, but, I can guarantee you this: that professor has been interviewed extensively by law enforcement. Yeah, yeah, that's already taken place. We may not ever know what was said. Um, no, uh, about Brian's parents. Um, I guess we'll just have to wait and see what comes out in the courtroom with them and their level of knowledge. How do you think he'll deal with a female blonde attorney? I have um, no idea. That's a we, great question. It depends, and I don't know enough. We have to bring Dr. Bricado back on, but uh, sometimes they have difficulty with females, right? And you don't know, you got to do the background on this guy. Did he have a problem with his mom? Um, is he, you know, latent homosexual or something? I mean, does he have sexual issues? Uh, is he hiding something? Is there a problem with him? Um, but he may have a problem with that female attorney, but she can handle herself. I'm not worried about it. Yeah, Anne, it uh, looks like she's got a lot of experience from her, her side yeah. over there. And yeah. if you just let's see here, uh oh, do you think? Whoops, I don't know what happened to that one. Do you think him holding his knees on the traffic stop, uh, hit his palms under side of his arms, where the you know that's a great question. I don't know uh, mm -hmm. if that was his intent. I know his phone was in between his lap. You can see it. Uh, so I think maybe that was. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah. So yeah. So you would expect to see something on the hands, just like, I mean, OJ had that, but he had the wrong kind of knife. Um, so, but he also probably wanted to keep his hands in clear view so they didn't get suspicious, whatever. I mean, I, to me, to me, he's not an interesting murderer. I mean, he's a shocking and horrific and an asshole murderer, so, but he's not an interesting guy. It's not, you know, it's a murder anybody could do. You get offended by somebody, they hurt your feelings. Now you're going to take it out on them for whatever your psychological problems are. You go in there and you slash a bunch of people with a brutal knife. Um, it's not an interesting murder. It's not a smart murder. Um, the guy's just an a-hole. I'm glad you're keeping it a family show as always. And uh, <laughs> me, the I Marine, said, hey. the Marine. <laughs> Military officers coming out now. Where's my Marine buddy? Uh, my other, my other Marine buddy that comes in here with. I got a lot of other words for him. Like, I mean, I'm not real happy with this kid. So, do they have to prove motive? Ah, it's a great question. Great question. So, no, they don't. That motive is not an element of the crime. So you never have to prove motive. Well, depending on the crime, I guess, but. Um, you don't have to say, well, he killed them because they hurt his feelings or whatever. In fact, if you try to start ascribing a motive, then you're going to be held. The jury's going to hold you to that. If you say, well, he, uh, he killed them because she rejected him for a date or they were at a bar and she insulted him. Now you've got to prove that. You've just added an element to the crime that you don't need to prove. Now, that being said, if you have evidence that you want to bring in um, that is character evidence, Sometimes you're going to have to say, well, we're using this to show motive, to get in evidence you ordinarily wouldn't be able to get in. Now I'm way down in the weeds of, you know, evidence. <laughs> so, uh, 
look at here. So you're you're getting Phillies. <laughs> exact, you're talking like Marines. Absolutely. Oh. And that's why we love uh, no. Billy. I mean, he is the real deal. Uh, so I'm, I, this I'm question. My tongue. Yes, I know you're, you're being good for me. I know you are because I know, you know, we've got, I try to make it at Any least. You know, DoorDash me. and BK missed one another. So, no. so remember in the affidavit, it looks like the, they kind of just pass one another. Yeah. I don't know if we're going to, we're, I don't know if we're going to know that uh, answer to you. No, I mean, some of life is just luck. That's just how it is. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> Thanks, Brittany. Uh, Sorry. Yeah, his professor, I guess, gave him rave reviews. Yeah, I mean, I think everybody that, uh, you know, remember there's three lives that we live, public, mm -hmm. private, and their secret life. This guy, you know, was get, living in the secret life, just like any any one of these other characters. Um, this one here, why the burglary charge in addition to the first degree murder strategy behind that's because. Okay. Um, so burglary, burglary is just entering a residential building with the intent to commit a felony. So if he went into there, let's say he didn't actually kill them, but he went in there for the purpose of trying to kill them, just entering that building. For, for that purpose is burglary. I know it's not, that's kind of a legal definition. Most people think of burglary like he's going to go in and steal a television. No, if you enter a building for the purpose of committing a felony, that's a burglary uh, according to the law. So they're going to, whatever they can put out there on the charge sheet that's supported by probable cause, they're going to do it and they should do it. So that's the burglary. It doesn't mean he's trying to steal something. It means he was went in there to commit a felony okay hang on i got a bunch of others here thanks katie bird good question uh thank you for your share uh for your service yeah the billy's amazing yeah i uh, look there is no way that Capital punishment's always debated, right? But there is no way that um, you can't at least understand the emotion behind wanting to kill somebody like that who just did something so shocking and evil, that that desire, and that's the part of the dark part of us. But I mean, when I see that and I hear that, that makes me want to kill them as well. So I guess that's the same bloodlust that they have, um, but I'm able to control it. So, yeah. Um, what do you think he was passing the girl in the hall? If convicted, could he use it for, can they, can they profit off of their, their no, crimes? They can't, you can't profit off a crime. Every state has a law against that. You can't, you can't go kill people. <laughs> hey, first sergeant, what's happening? <laughs> Just in a jar. I, lo I love you guys. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, Hey, first sergeant, I'm sorry that you were in the army. <laughs> no, I'm just we kidding. Love we love this. This we love this uh, this chat. You guys are so respectful and so great. Um, let's see here. Sorry, I almost uh, we're no, how you doing on time? I know you're you're jumping on time. So how are we doing? Yeah. No, I, um, but Willie, I think my head has gotten fatter over the years, so I don't think it'll still fit in that <laughs> jar. I, I eat too many cookies. Too These are pills. more of comments. Ask the dad about the knife. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you, everybody. You're so kind, so generous, and no, sorry. He got I, rid of that knife. I guarantee he he ditched that knife somewhere. We, he's got it. He still has it, though. I I, I think you know oh, he's going to have it somewhere. You know what I mean? But you're right. He he also changed the license plates uh, on the vehicle. At least he's getting ready to. Um, do you think there's a path yeah. to the father? Uh, is there even a clear yeah. bar? I don't, I don't know, but you, you think maybe yeah. accessory accessory after the fact, and you and I've talked about this. So let's, yeah. let's say uh, your buddy, and I'm going to steal your example. Cause I think it's a, Hey, aim high, man. I'm an air force guy too, David. All right. So, uh, so, so you, let's say somebody goes in and they shoot up a seven 11 and, uh, they 
now all of a sudden, you know, they robbed the potato chips or whatever they took. They killed some people. Uh, they call their buddy. Um, hey, come and pick me up. I'm at 7-Eleven down on Main Street. You go pick them up. Now, you didn't know when you were going to pick them up that they were had just gone in there and held up a place and shot a bunch of people. But when you get there uh, and they jump in the car and you see the mess that's going on, now you got to make a decision, right? You're going to drive them away from the crime scene because if you do and you had reason to know that there that they had just committed a crime, you are now an accessory after the fact. Am I right, Chris? Yep. No, you're right. It's whatever action they take, you know, with consciousness thought process, they, they know what they're doing. I.e., if, if there's any evidence that comes out that he says, Dad, I did A, B, C, and D, I need your help, and Father doesn't do E, F, and G and turn them in, he's toast. He's toast. You know, he really is. His lawyer looks like a victim type. Can, can she handle him? Uh, I think. Yeah. So the personality, Chris, do you mind if I answer that one? Okay. Oh, you still there? You, you locked up, you seized up. So that's okay. You're there. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So we talked a little bit about this before, but some, some clients have a problem with a certain type. Now he's going to try to control her because she's a female and she's that victim type. He's going to try to control her. Uh, she's not going to have any of it. So there were, there were cases and I can't talk about them for <laughs> reasons, but there were cases where I had attorneys who would try to placate the defendant so that they wouldn't get fired by the defendant. Uh, this is not going to be one of those cases. She is not going to placate him. She's going to do her job. She's going to be professional. She's going to build a relationship, uh, but she's not going to be run by him. Uh, he will try to run her, but she's not going to let that happen. This is not a case that she is going to make her career, right? So she's doesn't have to have this case. If he starts saying, well, I'll fire you. I'm like, okay, go fire me. We'll go talk to the judge. The judge may or may not let him fire her, but that may come up at some point, several months down the road. Chris. So the, the, I like this one here. Do you believe there's a lot more DNA evidence? I, I think there is. Yeah. I think it was 50%, 51 Chris, you're breaking up. Sorry. All right, you're gonna you're gonna have to run here. No, you're you're breaking up. So you're. Um, yes, I agree with that. Um, Hang on, let me. Uh, Billy, uh, Billy, you run the show for a minute. Well, uh, okay, let me run uh, the show for I, a second. Uh, <laughs> you just put, put the questions up there. Well, I uh, I I did notice that his. Uh, Nose has been broken, um, but if you look closely, you see mine's a little sideways too. So I've been <laughs> um, punching the nose myself. But he looks like the kind of guy that probably can't defend himself. So he probably has been punched in the nose, or um, but he does. I did notice that his nose was broken as well, um, probably because I've got the same problem. Thanks, thanks, mom. Uh, you should be very proud, very proud of your sons. Um, am yeah, am I lock. back? Yeah, you're back. Mama, four boys, two of her sons are JAG officers. Did a good job raising those boys. I had to go to space with Elon Musk. He just sent me back. He said, what are you doing here? Get out of here. He kicked you, know, you off his said... Twitter. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Let's, okay. Uh, is there anything else that's good? I mean, love that from the mama, four boys. Good job. I mom. think, I think we're, uh, so there's a, this, you know, depending on what they went there for, uh, could show again, that towards that problem of yeah, so who knew what consciousness of guilt, evasion, um, concealment, fleeing all consciousness of guilt. 
if in fact that's what they were doing right as billy and i have been saying here right. we're not saying the dad's involved we're not saying the dad's going to be involved we're saying if there is evidence that puts him into the circle after the incident or before the incident uh, and that can be a variety of evidence it can be cell phone evidence it could be you know t uh, any type of data from the cast team the self cell phone analysis survey team from fbi uh if there's receipts if there's conversations anything like that that is problematic for anybody who's been doing that even if it's not you know family members if it's a friend he says hey help me get out of here blah blah yes. blah so it, marlena it, yes they do uh, marlena they they will get that they will they will have victim witness advocates assigned to them um so and they will get to say something at sentencing they are allowed to make a statement at sentencing but they also get to say something to the prosecutor and what they want the sentence to be um, yes and to be clear to thank you eve there is no evidence implicating the father yeah, but hold on, time out, time out, time out. The questions we're asking, I guarantee, are the questions that were asked by the investigators in this case. We are asking the same questions that any competent investigator would ask about the father. What did you know? What did you talk about? Why did you go out there? Uh, what were the conversations about? Um, why did you go through Colorado? Why did you take a detour? Was this a pre-planned thing? I mean, you'd be you'd be incompetent if you didn't ask the questions we're asking. Any competent investigator would ask these questions. So um, I don't know what the answers to the questions are. I'm not pretending like I know what the answers are, but I'm telling you the questions have to be asked. So. And that's why, that's why we, we bring the reality uh, on this channel. We love that question and we love you being here. We're grateful for it. And I, I guarantee you there's a whole bunch more that was going on behind the scenes. And there's oh. a whole lot more now that the, you know, the young man is in custody. And, and here's another thing to consider. If they don't have access, the agency doesn't have access to the individuals to ask them outside of those two traffic stops. Mm -hmm. Well, then they, that puts the agency in a, in a really interesting position. And that position is to use the forensics evidence, whatever it is, to tell the story. Uh, and this is, it goes back to even the footprint in front of the door of the young lady. That's, that footprint told a story. Now, we don't know what that story, you know, means. But that if we, what we do know is there is a footprint in front of that young lady's door. Here, all, let, let me give a, a final thought about the way you can open your mind about these investigations, not you, Chris, but the people who are listening. So that footprint. Okay, so if you want to think about how to understand the crime scene, tell, tell the story of the footprint. Tell it from the footprint, from the shoe's perspective that made that footprint. Tell the story of what happened that night from the perspective of that shoe, right? What was the shoe doing? How did the shoe get on his foot? What was going on in the house? Was the shoe surprised when this was going on? Was the shoe running? I mean, think about all the different perspectives. Um, yeah, you're right, Greg. Of course they question him. I mean, they, they've done a great job on this case. They, there's no way they missed that. <laughs> no way. Um, but when you start telling the story from different perspectives of the pieces that were at the crime scene, um, you start to get a more complete picture of what happened there. So start thinking about it. Uh, if you want to play with it for you all want to play with it in your head, tell it from the perspective of the sheath, right? Think about what was the sheath thinking? How would the sheath tell the story that night? Where was it? It wasn't on his belt loop, right? Why, why am I being carried like this? Why am I in this house? What, and then when the snap comes off and the knife comes out, 
wait, why am I here? And why am I in this bed? And what do I see when I'm laying in this bed with these people? And do I have blood on me? Why? So anyway, there's, it's a way of understanding. I know Chris, you do this, um, but you've got to sit in the room and look at it from all four corners and all the different perspectives. Yeah, absolutely. And so good night tonight, Billy, you've, uh, as always, uh, just give us so much to think about. And so what I'm going to do is as always give you the final word and then we're going to go to Hawaii. So if you're good with that, brother, uh, yeah. you- uh, prayers to those families, um, that are suffering. We're thankful for the great work that law enforcement has done. Uh, and our hearts go out to those families who are suffering. And thankfully, they've got somebody off the street. They wrap this up. Good job. Hard working every day. I'm stressed out. 24 7, babe. No, no timeouts. Wish we could fly away. You and I go to our favorite place. Oh yeah, yeah, make special memories together. I'll be your company now and forever. I say we fly away. You and me go to our favorite place. Feeling the sun on my face in a while. Facing away